Hello, everybody. How are you? Perfect. Are you ready for some fun? That's great. Let's start. Over the next two hours, I just want to show you some very, very specific problems in SQL Server, mainly ugly problems in SQL Server, how you can identify those problems, how you can analyze, and finally, hopefully, how we can fix those problems. A few words about my person. My name is Klaus Aschenbrenner. I come from Vienna in Austria. We have no kangaroos in Austria, so Austria is not Australia. That's also very, very important when I'm talking in the US. When I'm telling that we have in Austria no kangaroos, half of the room is laughing, and the other half of the room has no idea why they are laughing. I'm an international conference speaker, means I'm traveling around my whole life talking, speaking about SQL Server, like these days here in Sweden. Don't ask me today which day is, I have no idea anymore. I have flown on Monday evening to Copenhagen, went by train to Malmö, talked yesterday in Malmö, same thing as today. Then I go by, well, then I went by train from Malmö to Gothenburg, spoke in the evening at Gothenburg, same thing as today. And today I went by train from Gothenburg to Stockholm and now I'm at my final destination and I'm showing you the same thing again. Great thing is I already know my content and I know your questions and I know your answers, hopefully. I'm also a Microsoft Certified Master for SQL Server 2008. It doesn't matter anymore. Microsoft just retired that certification. They have made no profit out of it, so it's not important. They just retired it. So a really, really strange story that happened here with that certification. I have also written the book Pro SQL Server 2008 Service Broker. Service Broker is an asynchronous messaging framework that Microsoft first introduced back with SQL Server 2005. With Service Broker, we are able to write asynchronous message-based applications. Who of you know Service Broker? A few of you, so you can see I'm mainly working with things that nobody cares about. No, just kidding. And you can find further information on my website at sqlpassion.at where I provide more information about the services that I'm offering, training and consulting services around Europe, and I also provide a huge amount of free training content around SQL Server. Who of you knows my SQL Server quickies? One person, we have to change that. Safe for work, it's just a YouTube channel where I provide in five to ten minutes an overview about one specific topic in SQL Server. So just quick and a dirty specific topic in SQL Server. Let's have a look on the agenda for the next two hours. As Lars has said, we will try to make a break in the middle. Let's see if it works or not. It will work. I just want to talk about four specific topics in SQL Server. Almost everything that I show you today somehow relates with locking, blocking, latching, and spin locking in SQL Server. So mainly I will talk about things where problems occur when SQL Server tries to coordinate, to synchronize internally the queries that we are running on SQL Server. And the first step, a very easy thing, just for warm up, I just want to talk about the isolation level we committed, and I want to show you one specific scenario where SQL Server is not running our transaction in read committed, even when we specify the isolation level read committed. It's already very, very interesting and an important thing to know 
in SQL Server. Afterwards, we will move on to a problem called thread pool starvation. So I just want to show you how we can crash SQL Server. With a CPU utilization of 0%. Means when you're looking to Desk Manager, you can see nothing happens on your CPUs. And SQL Server also doesn't react anymore. Means when you want to connect to SQL Server, nothing happens. Very, very interesting when you want to troubleshoot that situation, because for troubleshooting SQL Server, we have to connect to SQL Server, and SQL Server doesn't respond anymore. So we have to see afterwards how we can solve that problem. Then we will do a short break, and then we will continue by talking about the public toilet of SQL Server, DampDB. DampDB is a very, very important database in SQL Server, which is just misconfigured by default, and I want to show you how easy it is to get into massive performance problems when you run your SQL Server installation with a default configuration of DampDB. And finally, spin lock contention. In this section, we will crash again SQL Server. I like crashing SQL Server, but this time we will crash SQL Server with a CPU utilization of 100%. Means all our CPUs are going up to 100%. SQL Server is just going crazy, burning down CPU cycles, but within SQL Server nothing happens. Sounds interesting? Perfect. If you have questions, just ask. If you are lucky, I have an answer. Let's talk in the first step about the isolation level read committed. Who of you knows the isolation level read committed? Everyone, because every transaction by default runs in the isolation level read committed. I just want to demonstrate you on the flip chart what it means to run a transaction in the isolation level with committed. Imagine we have a table with four rows and we want to read from that table. When we read records in SQL Server, SQL Server always acquires a so-called shared lock. In read committed, imagine we perform a scan of an index or a table scan. We are reading those four records, and when we read the first record, SQL Server acquires a shared lock on that first record. Then we read that record of our database. When we have read that record, we release that shared lock. Then we move on to the second record. We acquire the shared lock on that record, then we read that record, when we have finally read that record, we release that shared lock. Same thing happens with the third record, and finally with the fourth record. Means at one point in time, we just have one shared lock on that record that we are currently reading. That's just the default behavior of the isolation level read committed. The problem that we have with the isolation level read committed is that we have no so-called read stability. Means when you're reading those rows within your transaction again, it can be the case that the row has changed by another transaction. When another transaction changes a row, for example with an update statement or a delete statement, that transaction acquires a so-called exclusive lock. And the exclusive lock is just incompatible with the shared lock. Means the exclusive lock blocks the shared lock, the shared lock blocks the exclusive lock. As you can see, when we have read those rows, when we have released those shared locks, we can acquire an exclusive lock on a specific row and we finally can change that row. 
then we release that exclusive log when we afterwards read the same rows again in our reading transaction we have the possibility to see different row versions. Therefore, we have no repeatable reads in the isolation level read committed. If you want to have repeatable reads, you have to lower down your isolation level to repeatable read. Means the isolation level repeatable read gives you repeatable reads, as the name implies. What SQL Server is doing in repeatable read is very simple. Imagine we have our table with our four records again and we are reading again that complete table. The difference is now that we acquire our shared log on the specific record but we don't release that shared log anymore. Means we read the first record, we read the second record, the third record and the fourth record. In repeatable read, we are holding our shared logs till the end of our transaction until we perform a commit or a rollback of that specific transaction. Of course, when someone else wants to change a specific record, the exclusive log gets blocked by the shared log. Means in that case, the reader blocks the writer, the select statement blocks the update statement and therefore, as a side effect, you have repeatable reads. Means you can read those rows multiple times within your transaction and you are getting back the same versions. That's the idea behind the isolation level repeatable read. And in some specific cases, SQL Server can also run internally your read committed transaction with the semantics of the isolation level repeatable read. Mainly, when you, are when you use in your table design LOB data columns, like a Fajra Max, where you can store up to 2 gigabytes of data, and in combination with a blocking operator in your execution plan, like a sort operator. Normally, when you have a sort operator in your execution plan, SQL Server just creates a copy of your data. The problem that we have with an LOB data type, we can store up to 2 gigabytes of data. Means when you copy that data, SQL Server has to write everything into DempDB. In that case, you would, you would flood DempDB with a huge amount of data. Therefore, SQL Server can't use that technique. And what SQL Server is doing is very simple. SQL Server just holds those shared logs till the end of our transaction because SQL Server just points with pointers to our original data instead of making a copy of that data. But the data must remain stable and SQL Server enforces that stability by just holding those shared logs till the end of our transaction because when we have acquired that shared log, nobody else can change our data and as a side effect, we have a stable data. Let's have a look on that. I create here a database and I create a very, very simple table. It's already in the evening. I'm just working with very, very simple tables. I have specified here the primary key constraint means SQL Server creates us in the background a unique clustered index and we are just physically pre-sorting our table data on that ID column. Then I insert three rows means we have now in that table three rows in a clustered index structure. Means when we look on that clustered index, we have the navigation structure of that clustered index and in the leaf level we have our three rows. That's just the structure that we have created. What I'm doing now in the next step is the following. I just start in a different session, a new transaction, and I'm just updating 
the third record in that clustered index. And we have here session ID of 53. That's the next thing that we will do. So I'm going to my second session. I'm copying that statement over. Now we have a session ID of 54, not 53. And we just update the third record in that clustered index without committing that transaction. Means we have a bending ongoing transaction. In a third session, I'm going into my database and I'm just reading rows. <coughs> of course, that statement blocks. Nothing special about that because we just scan now that clustered index in the leaf level with a scan operation. We acquire the shared log on the first row. We read that row. We release that shared log. We acquire the shared log on the second row. We read that row. We release the shared log. And finally, we try to acquire the shared log on the third row. And here we have to wait because the shared lock is just blocked by the exclusive lock of the different session. Just a traditional blocking situation in SQL Server. When I'm going the whole time backward and forth, it takes a huge amount of meters. And finally, we can also look into the lock manager of SQL Server, system 2 n locks. When we go to system 2 n logs, where the request session ID equals, what's the session ID that is waiting? 53. When we restrict on 53, you can see that SQL Server has acquired an intent shared log on the table level, which was granted, an intent shared log on the page level, which was granted, and currently we just wait on the key log on the last record in our clustered index that we want to read. Just traditional behavior, traditional implementation. Nothing special about that thing. Let's stop that query. As you can see here from that query, I have only referenced column two. When we look to our table definition, which I have somewhere here, column two is just an integer data type. Let's reference now column three, which is a Farcha max column where we can store up to two gigabytes of data. As you can see, I have here also an order by. When we look on the estimated plan, you can see in that case, SQL Server just introduces a sort operator, means we have a blocking operator. So we have not a situation that we have an execution plan with a blocking operator in combination with an LOB data type column that we are referencing. Of course, statement still blocks. We are waiting on the shared log on the third row that we try to read from that clustered index. When we look now again into the log manager, things are changing. Instead of one key log, we have now currently three key logs. SQL Server has acquired the shared log on the first row, SQL Server has acquired the shared log on the second row, and finally we are waiting on the shared log on the third row. Means SQL Server behaves now internally as when we run that transaction in repeatable <coughs> read. We are just holding those shared logs till the end of our transaction. Just think about that. We still run that statement, that session, in the default isolation level of read committed, but internally SQL Server runs that transaction in repeatable read. Imagine you're reading more than 5,000 rows. What happens? 
when you have acquired more than 5,000 row level locks. Any idea? A lock escalation. In that case, SQL Server escalates the individual shared locks to one shared lock on the table level. Means you have a table which is read only. You can only read from that table anymore, but you are not able to change anything. Just think about that. Okay, makes sense? Yes? No? Maybe? I know it's already late. So that's very, very important. I have already seen database designs, table designs, where developers just have used everywhere Fatra Max, just to be sure. It works even with one character, but internally we just introduce side effects in SQL Server. <coughs> what do you think about that statement? What execution plan would you expect from that specific SQL statement? A bad one. We are scanning our complete clustered index. In that case, the clustered index scan returns us three rows. And finally, we have a filter operator with a predicate which just discards non-qualifying rows. Imagine your table is 40 gigabytes large. You're reading those 40 gigabytes from your slow storage subsystem into the buffer pool and finally that filter operator maybe discards all the rows. Means, logically, you have requested zero rows, but physically SQL Server has to read the complete table into your buffer pool to return you those zero rows. Just think about that. So LOP columns have some side effects in SQL Server. Questions on that? You are so silent. Come on. I'm not biting you. Perfect. Let's roll back that transaction and let's go back to PowerPoint. Let's talk now about thread pool starvation. Who has already heard about thread pool starvation in SQL Server? What does it mean? There are no worker threads available anymore to execute our queries. That's interesting. When we run queries in SQL Server, let's just say single threaded queries to make things easier, every query just gets a worker thread. Means with a query one, that query gets a worker thread. We have a second query, that query gets a worker thread. We have a third query, that query gets a worker thread. How many worker threads gives you SQL Server? It depends on what. number of logical cores and if you're running SQL Server on x32 or x64. If you still run SQL Server on x32, you have some problems. Or very small systems. Yeah. <laughs> Forget about that database. In my case, my virtual machine is x64. For AdventureWorks, large database. I have four processor cores assigned to that VM, and in that case, SQL Server gives me by default 512 worker threads. 
Problem is, what happens when you use internally or when you consume internally more worker threads? Then we have that problem called thread pool starvation. Every query in SQL Server implements a so-called query life cycle. A query can be in three different states in SQL Server. Running, suspended, and runnable. Means a query is in the state running as long as we are not waiting on an external resource. As soon as you are waiting on an external resource, like a page that you are reading from your slow storage subsystem into your buffer pool, or for example, when you are waiting on an incompatible lock, SQL Server moves that query from the running state into the suspended state means in the suspended state, we are just waiting. We are waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting. And at some point in time, that resource that we are waiting on becomes available. So we acquire that shared lock, for example, when we read a record. And then SQL Server moves us into the runnable state. And in the runnable state, we have to wait until if CPU becomes available. And finally, SQL Server moves us again into the running state and everything happens over and over and over and over again. Even when you run a very simple select star query, it can be the case that that query goes 100,000 times, millions of times through that query life cycle. The most important thing here to remember is when you are in the suspended state, when they run able state, you still have your worker thread assigned. Means when I run that three queries and those queries are in the suspended state, we are also using those worker threads. Means those worker threads are not available for other queries. Imagine we have a huge amount of queries which are, which are waiting in the suspended state. Imagine we have here, let's say, 600 queries which are waiting. That's not possible. Because we have only 512 worker threads. And then you have the problem called thread pool starvation in SQL Server. With a configuration option called max worker threads, this one is by default zero and based on a formula, SQL Server gives you the number of worker threads. You can also set that to a specific value, not really recommended. The problem is when there are no threads available anymore, the question is, how can you troubleshoot that specific problem? Because for troubleshooting, you have to connect to SQL Server, but SQL Server can't give you any worker thread anymore, means you are not able to connect to SQL Server. Let's have a look on that one. I can show you in the first step that formula that I have mentioned which is documented in books online. And based on the number of CPU cores and your processor architecture, SQL Server gives you specific number of worker threads. As I have said, in my case, I have four logical processors. X64 means, in my virtual machine, I have 512 worker threads available. Let's create a new database. Let's create a new table. And let's insert just one record. And I create 
the simplest stored procedure on Earth. I'm just selecting from that table. Means when we execute that stored procedure, we get back that row that we have inserted. Very simple things. As I've said, we have that configuration option max worker threads. By default, the config value is zero, means SQL Server gives you those worker threads based on the formula that I have shown you previously. You can go to system OS sysinfo, column max worker count, and SQL Server tells you how many worker threads you have ever labeled. In my case, the 512 that I have mentioned. What I'm doing in the next step, in a different session, I'm just running an update statement without committing that transaction and with a query hinder just acquire or request uh, exclusive lock on the table level. Imagine you are updating more than 5,000 rows in a table and SQL Server triggers a lock escalation. In that case, you have also an exclusive lock on your table. Means everyone that wants to read from that table, everyone that wants to change a record in that table, just have to wait. And what I'm doing now in the next step, I'm using the tool ostress.exe. Ostress.exe is part of the so-called RML utilities, which you can download for free from Microsoft, from Codeplex. And with ostress.exe, you can simulate multiple users in SQL Server. Means we are connecting to my SQL Server instance, and I'm executing that stored procedure with the simple select star statement with 600 users means 600 users are trying to read from that table but this doesn't work because they have to wait because of the incompatible exclusive lock on the table level. Let's do that. Let's copy that over to the command prompt and let's execute those 600 users. Takes a few seconds until the users are connected to SQL Server and now your red phone rings. Your business users are complaining. SQL Server is so slow. Nothing happens. You look into Task Manager and yeah, nothing happens. CPU utilization 0%. So we try to connect to SQL Server. Oops. SQL Server doesn't work anymore. We can't connect to SQL Server anymore. Why? Because we have no worker threads. Nice. How can you recover SQL Server from that situation? What is the deck? Dedicated admin connection. Never ever answer reboot SQL Server. Of course, you can restart SQL Server, but restarting SQL Server is always a bad idea. You lose all the cache data in your buffer pool. You lose all your estimated execution plans in the planned cache. You lose all the content in the various dynamic management views. So restarting SQL Server not really recommended. How can we connect with the DAC? admin column instance name. That's also very, very important. You should know how you can connect with the dedicated admin connection to SQL Server. Admin column instance name. Let's do that. Error message, forget about it. And we are in SQL Server. We are connected to SQL Server. We have a session ID 577. 
Now you have to know SQL Server. There's no IntelliSense. IntelliSense needs a connection. We have no worker threads. Means the dedicated admin connection is just a backdoor into SQL Server. As long as SQL Server.exe is running, you can connect to SQL Server. The dedicated admin connection gives you a dedicated scheduler with a worker thread, gives you a memory node, and gives you also a TCP IP port. Means you can always connect to SQL Server. I'm copying over some code. And now let's try to analyze that situation. In the first step, you can go to system exec requests and you can see which requests we are currently executing in SQL Server. As you can see, CPU utilization from a SQL Server perspective is 0%. Nothing happens. So let's do that one. We have here a huge amount of queries, 521, which are currently waiting. Wait type, lock mode intent shared, means we want to read from that table and in the first step SQL Server tries to acquire the intent shared lock on the table level. This already blocks, query goes into the suspended state and SQL Server reports us the wait type lock mode intent shared. We can see the wait resource on which we are waiting. Object means we are waiting on the table level. Database ID 10 and the 2455 is just the object ID of that specific table on which you are waiting on that intent shared lock. You have your waiting time, 220 seconds. You have the session ID. And you have also the so-called blocking session ID. SQL Server tells you who is blocking that session. That's also very, very important. The question is now, I have submitted 600 users, 600 queries to SQL Server. Why we have only 521 waiting desks? Where are the other ones? No, they are still alive. They are waiting outside. <coughs> when you have no worker thread, you can't be in system exec requests. Means they are waiting outside of SQL Server. They have no worker thread, means those queries are not yet executed. When you see a query in system exec requests, it means that the query is already running. Those queries can't run the other ones because they are waiting on a worker thread. And you can see them in system always waiting desks. And they are reporting a wait type of thread pool. That's a really, really terrible wait type. You can see here we have 16 queries which are waiting of the waiting type thread pool. Means they are waiting until SQL Server can give them a worker thread and then they can start query execution. And as you can see, those waiting sessions, they have no session IDs. They are not yet started. They're just waiting outside. You are waiting inside, you are waiting on that lock. The other ones are just waiting outside for a worker thread. Just think about that one. That's very, very important. A thread pool wait type is very, very terrible because it means your queries can't start query execution because they are waiting on a, uh, they are waiting on a worker thread. Just imagine that. When we go up again to system exec requests, we can try now to analyze who is our so-called head blocker. What is that query which blocks all those queries? You can see we have here session ID and we have a blocking session ID. For example, session ID 68 is blocked by 64, 64 is blocked by 55. 
In that case, session ID 55 that we have here is our head blocker. What do you do with that head blocker? Kill him. Before you kill someone, talk to him. <laughs> so let's analyze that head blocker. Let's go to system X accessions to see what query is that. You have the login time, you have the host name, you have the program name, you have the login name. Oops, that's me. Not so good. With that session ID, you can also go to System Exec Connections. In System Exec Connections, you have a very, very important column. The most recent SQL handle. SQL Server tells you the last SQL statement, the last word that that person, that query has executed before you kill him. We can grab that most recent SQL handle and with the dynamic management function system exec SQL text, you can retrieve the SQL statement. So you know, whoops, you know what that SQL statement was. How can you get the estimated execution plan from the plan cache? Sorry? I think you use the same kind of There is a dynamic management function system exec query plan. The problem is that dynamic management function accepts a query plan handle. And the query plan handle is different as the SQL handle. So the question is how you can get a query plan handle from a SQL handle. Any ideas? Why query stats? Yeah, you need, let's call it a mapping DMV. You just need to know a DMV, a dynamic management view, which gives you a SQL handle column and a query plan handle column. System exec query stats. Very simple. Let's go to system exec. Well, I can't type anymore. Query stats, where the SQL handle is the handle from above. We don't find here anything. When you find something, you have your SQL handle and you have your plan handle. Means you can grab that plan handle and you can call system exec query plan System exec query plan to get the estimated execution plan from the plan cache. Just think about that. We were going to system exec requests. We have analyzed what our head blocker is. With that session ID, we were going to system exec connections. We have grabbed the most recent SQL handle. Based on the most recent SQL handle, we have retrieved the SQL statement with system exec query stats, we have retrieved the plan handle, and with the plan handle, finally the execution plan. Impressive, isn't it? And finally, when you have analyzed that query, and the person isn't coming back to your office anymore, you kill it. Means in that case, the head blocker rolls back, releases the exclusive lock, the other sessions can acquire the shared lock, and 
we have recovered SQL Server from that thread pool starvation scenario without restarting SQL Server. And as a side note, you can't kill yourself in SQL Server, your own session ID. Self-suicide is not possible. Okay? And finally, when you are finished with that dedicated admin connection, you disconnect. You have only one. That's your wife or your husband. You have to be very, very, very careful. Otherwise, you are locked out of SQL Server or you are locked out of your house and you have to restart your life. Okay, so that's very, very important that you afterwards disconnect from the dedicated admin connection. There's just one. When you have lost it, not so good. Questions on that? Well, you have to hope that the session is killable. Yeah. <coughs> of course. Then you have a problem, of course. Then you have to restart, for example, SQL Server. Yeah. yeah. Other questions? Yeah. Is there any reason not to set you know, the number of uh, workers rate really high and instead of 500, say, to 10,000, just to avoid this? Every worker thread needs additional memory means normally SQL Server itself is smart enough to, f to figure out how many worker thread he needs. As I've said here, here we have of course already a really, really bad query in front of us. A very long running transaction where you have an exclusive lock on the table level. Of course, when you have such a query, you also have to know the side effects. As I've said previously, imagine you're deleting 5,000 rows from a huge table or more than 5,000 rows from a huge table and SQL Server triggers a lock escalation. In that case, you also have your exclusive lock on the table level and all the other ones have to wait. So what you're saying, this will happen if you run enough queries at the same time sooner or later? Yeah. It's the same when you are running SQL Server with the stupid default configuration with the max DOB of zero. Max DOB of zero means the DOB defines how many worker thread each parallel operator in a parallel execution plan can use. Means when you have a parallel plan in front of you, it can be the case or it will be the case that the parallel plan itself uses more worker threads than the max DUB option. Because the max DUB just defines how many worker threads each parallel operator can use in the execution plan, not the execution plan overall. So just think about that one when you're running a huge amount of parallel plans on a system. In that case, you're also exhausting those <coughs> worker threads and maybe your queries are reporting that thread pool weight type. We can also look to our weight stats. And as you can see, we had here waiting tasks and waiting times. As I've said previously, thread pool a very, very bad one because queries are waiting for query execution. Another wait type, which is also a very, very bad one, is for example, resource semaphore. Resource semaphore. Every time when you have a query in front of you and that query has, for example, sort operations, hash operations, the query needs a so-called uh, so memory grant. And that memory must be granted before the query starts query execution. When that query memory 
is already exhausted in SQL Server because you are running a huge amount of queries, then queries also have to wait for their execution and they are reporting that wait type resource semaphore. So that's also a Poison wait type. Queries are just waiting for query execution. So thread pool, resource semaphore, those are wait types that you don't want to see within SQL Server. Those are just bad ones. Just means queries are not doing anything. They are waiting for query execution. Other questions? Perfect. Half time. So let's break for how many seconds? Let's break for 15 minutes to make it easy. And then we will continue with the public toilet of SQL Server, DampTB.